Amen. 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 All right, turn your Bible to the book of Jonah. Uh. Jonah, 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 a famous story. In my Bible, it's page 1,216. Jonah. All the Bibles have different page numbers. Jonah. <clears throat> Jonah was written sometime between 724, 724 and 729 B.C. I'm sorry, in 709 B.C. Somewhere in here. 724 to 709 B.C., which is about 15 years. 15 years span, somewhere in there. The author is, I'll give you one guess. Jonah. <laughs> Jonah. Jonah. 2 Kings 14, 25. The Bible says in 2 Kings 14, 25, it says something interesting. Talking about Amaziah, I believe, the king. It says, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, According to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath-hefer. Huh. So Jonah, the prophet, was from a land called Gath-hefer. Uh, in other places, that's called Zebulon, which is in the land of Galilee. So Jonah was a man from Galilee. Does that sound like anybody you've ever heard of, starting with a J? Yeah. Jesus was a man. Who came out of Galilee. Jonah went down into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Can you think of anybody else who did that? Jesus. Jonah's a good picture of Jesus. Now, just in that sense, uh, Jonah disobeyed God, unlike Jesus. Jesus never did just disobey the commands of his father, but Jonah did. We're going to look at just some of the main verses after I tell you how many chapters, verses, and words. In Jonah, there are four chapters. There are 48 verses, and there are 1,320 words. Why do we need to know? Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In Jonah, we're just going to look through a few key verses here. We're not going to take too much time, but... If you haven't heard the story, you should read the book of Jonah. It's one of the, the coolest stories you'll ever read. Very, very interesting. Jonah chapter 1 in verse 2, the Bible says, I'll start in verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. You know what that means? Get up. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. Jonah, what city was he supposed to cry against? Nineveh. Nineveh. Pronounce it however you want. I hear you back there saying Nineveh or something. That's what it looks like. Nineveh. Uh, it's how I pronounce it. That's how I've always heard it. Maybe it's supposed to be pronounced Nineveh. I don't know. Nineveh is a little easier to make. Jonah is told, cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Look at verse 3. Did Jonah obey? No. No. It says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord, so in verse 3 we have, but Jonah verse 4 we have, but the Lord comes back and counters what Jonah does. It's a really good story. You should read it. It, it only takes probably 30, 45 minutes to read the book of Jonah. Very good read. Look at chapter 2 and verse 2. After Jonah has been shipwrecked and tossed out of a ship, not shipwrecked, but after he's been tossed out of a ship, what comes up from the water and eats him? A whale. A whale. A whale. Now this in the book of Jonah, it says it's a great fish. But Jesus tells us later on that it's a whale. And while he's in the belly of the whale, for how long? Three days. Three days, three nights. 
Three days and three nights in the whale's belly. In chapter 2, Jonah's in the fish's belly. Look at verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now Jonah wasn't just talking nonsense when he said, out of the belly of hell cried I. He wasn't just being metaphorical, Jonah died in that whale's belly, and he went to hell. Amen. Out of the belly of hell cried I. You say, why is that important? Because Jesus, when he died, went to hell. That's what the Bible says. And it says, thou wilt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I'm sorry, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. When Jesus died, he went from that grave down into hell, and he preached to those spirits in prison. <clears throat> And he went over to paradise and preached to those uh, say, or he preached to those saints, so they could have a chance to go to heaven with him. So Jonah, right there, is a picture of Jesus going to hell for three days and three nights. Out of the belly of hell cried I, is what Jonah said. Look at chapter three and verse ten. Jonah gets spit up by the whale. He lands on the shore and he decides, you know what? Maybe I should go to Nineveh. Uh, disobeying God didn't work out so well for me. So he goes and he preaches to Nineveh, and what Jonah wants is for Nineveh to be destroyed, just like God says. Look at verse 10. After his preaching, the Ninevites repented. They quit their sin. Look at verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So what's the evil? Uh... In verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4, here's what Jonah preached. Jonah walked around the city. He entered into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, right here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 words. He would walk through the city and preach these 8 words. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. How's that for a sweet gospel message? <laughs> Yet 40 days. You got 40 days to die, you know, make peace. You got 40 days, and they listened, and they quit doing their sin. So what happened? We just read it in verse 10. God did not do the evil that he said he would do to them. And then in chapter 4, we know that Jonah was upset and displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Jonah wanted them all to die, but they didn't. And God was there to teach Jonah a lesson. Two big things I like to take away from Jonah. One, when God says do something, you do it. You do not disobey and try to run. When God says go, you go. He said, arise, go to Nineveh, and cry against it. <clears throat> Three things. And what Jonah should have done was say, what should I say while he was on the way? You know, right then he should have been arisen and gone. And uh, maybe crying in case they could hear him already. When God says do something, you do it. You do it right away, as hard and as fast as you can with all of your soul. You do everything you can to obey the Lord right when he says to. And the consequences for you will be rewards from God. He rewards those who obey him. If you disobey him, you just might find yourself swallowed up by a fish in the sea, which is not a great place to be. That's the book of Jonah. Number one, obey God. Number two, a good thing to take away from Jonah is how merciful God is. Nineveh was a wicked city. Nineveh was a wicked city. Like, really wicked. Like, so wicked... That about a hundred years later, God has a prophet named Nahum come to Nineveh to preach against them. Nineveh is all about, or Nahum is all about Nineveh and how wicked they are. A hundred years later and how God's going to destroy them and I gave you a chance before and you're not going to get a second chance. You're done this time. But he was merciful. He gave them a chance. They took the chance to repent and they repented and God did not destroy him right then. He does destroy them later. Because they turn back to their sin. God is merciful. That's the book of Jonah. Any questions about the book of Jonah? Things you've always wondered? A fun fact that I always... First, when, uh, when science contradicts the Bible, you can always believe the Bible over science. If you go to school on Monday, they will tell you in science class that whales are not fish. Whales are mammals, according to science, just like you and me. We're
we're a lot like a whale, right? <laughs> yeah. The only thing, I don't have anything in common with a whale that I know of, except, you know, they say they, they birth their children and they uh, feed them milk, I think. So science will tell you a whale is not a fish. But right here, God says it was a great fish. And Jesus says it's a whale. So what does that tell me? A whale is a fish. fish and science is silly. A whale is not like a kangaroo. <laughs> okay. Good. That's Jonah. Next, we've got the book of... Micah. What is it? Micah. Micah. These are minor prophets. Micah was written sometime around... 672 to 613 BC. <coughs> I don't have dates for all of these. Um, I only put the date if I'm sure that it's somewhere in there. The book of Micah has seven chapters, 105 verses, and 3,152 words. Seven chapters, 105 verses, 3,152 words. Who do you think wrote Micah? Micah. Micah. That's a pretty good guess. Pretty good guess. I think it's Micah. I'm not positive. But if the uh, book's named after a guy, you know, it doesn't really matter who wrote it down. These are the words that Micah preached. If you look at chapter 1 and verse 1, we're going to read a good chunk out of... Not a good chunk, a little bit of the book of Micah here. Micah 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Moorish site, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Whenever you see this word, Samaria, <laughs> when you see the word Samaria, you should know that this is like a sister city to this city right here. We've got maps, or we have maps. Um, this one will do. In uh, Solomon's day, when Solomon was king of Israel, the nation of Israel was all around here. Uh, this was all one big nation. And I don't have the city of Samaria on here, but it's on here somewhere on this map. When the nation divided, the kingdom divided, it divided into two parts, the north and the south, right? Yep. What was the south called? Judah. 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 What was the southern kingdom called? Good. What was the south called? Judah. Judah. Good. What was the southern kingdom called? Judah. All right, everybody together. What was the southern kingdom called? Judah. Judah. Judah, good. The southern kingdom was called? Judah. Judah. The northern kingdom was called Israel. The south was Judah. The north was Israel. The capital of the south, the capital of Judah, was Jerusalem. In the south. Well, I've covered it up. The capital of Judah was Jerusalem. The capital of the north, the capital of Israel, was Samaria. So when you see Samaria, it's talking about the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And that's what he's talking about right here in Micah. Now, look at Micah chapter 2, verse 6. Micah 2, 6. We're just going to take a walk through the book and see some things that Micah had to say. God tells Micah in 2.6, Prophesy ye not. Say they, say they to them that prophesy, they shall not prophesy to them, that they shall not take shame. He's telling him, tell the prophets not to prophesy. Tell the preachers to shut their mouths in Samaria. Verse 7, O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? That's a good message right there. Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? You know God's words, like Haley read earlier, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. But you think about it, this book's got at least two edges. A good side and a bad side. 
And, you know, with a sword, a king can make you a knight, or he can cut your head off. <clears throat> Same thing's true with this Bible. If you obey it, right here it says, Are not, uh, Do not my words do good unto him that walketh uprightly? If you walk uprightly and do right, his words will help you, and they'll do good to you. But if you do wickedly and evil, these words will turn against you. They'll hurt you. They'll cut you. They'll sting you. And you say, why would they do that? Just like a dad should spank his kids to teach them, you're doing wrong, you need to straighten out. God will do that with his words. It'll teach you, you're doing wrong, you need to straighten out. That's Micah chapter 2, 6, and 7. Look at verse 12. Micah 2, verse 12. He says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. Right now, the Jews on the earth are scattered all across the world. They're everywhere. There's some here. There's some in California. There's some in Saudi Arabia. There's some in India. There's some in China. They're, the Jews are spread all over the world. God has scattered them to different nations. But he promises that he will assemble them. He will gather them. He will put them together together. And that's the purpose of the tribulation, is to bring all the Jews back to Israel so that God can deal with them as with sons. Chapter 5, verse 2. That, right, that verse right there was to remind you that in these minor prophets, there's an awful lot of negative preached against Israel. But in every single minor prophet except Jonah, I believe it's except Jonah, there is a glimmer of hope for the Jews, a reminder that, hey, even though I'm going to hurt you, it's all for a reason, and I'm going to bring you back to the land that I promised you. Uh, God's promises to Abraham will be fulfilled. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This one should be familiar. But thou, O Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee, out of Bethlehem, shall, come he, uh, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So who's that man who came out of Bethlehem? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus Christ came from Bethlehem, and Micah said he would several hundred years before Jesus was ever born. Last, look at Micah 7, verse 16. Micah 7, 16. If you didn't know it before, I want to let you know now, when the end of the world comes, you want to be on God's side. And if you're not on God's side, it will not be good for you. Micah 7, verse 16. The nations shall see... Actually, look at 15. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. You ever done that? I don't believe what I'm seeing. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth, their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? People always say, how could a good God send people to hell? Here's my question. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? Amen. God pardons iniquity. He forgives your sins. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a good God. He doesn't have to, but he chose to. That's a kind God. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Now that one's specifically for the Jews right there. He passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. The remnant of those Jews, those few Jews who are left, Come the end of the tribulation, he's going to overlook their transgressions. He's that merciful and kind. He does that so that he can fulfill his promise to Abraham. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Book of Micah. Does anybody have questions on Micah? We are moving right along. Micah. These minor prophets are pretty short books, and they're fun reads. You should give them a read. 
Uh, that was the book of Micah. Next, we've got Nahum. Who can tell me what city Nahum is about? Nineveh. Nineveh. Good. The book of Nahum is the burden of what city? Nineveh. Nineveh. Look at Nahum 1.1. 1, 1. It says, the burden of? Nineveh. Nineveh. <laughs> Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum, the El Koshite. The book of Nahum has three chapters. 47 verses and 1,284 words. Let's see what Nahum has to say. In verse 1, the burden of Nineveh. God uses that phrase a few times in the prophets, the burden. It's like if he got up, it's like if pastor got up in church on Sunday and said, the burden of robins. Robins, you've allowed a, a bar that sells alcohol, liquor, and, and all kinds of wickedness, and they have swear words sitting on the outside of the bar, and they have, you know, whatever, tobacco, and they have marijuana, and they have all kinds of stuff that we don't want and that God is not pleased with. And robins, you've had, you know, whatever. I don't know what Robbins has done too much, but they're not righteous, I can tell you that. The city of Robbins, you've got false churches preaching false gospels. You have a beautiful building called the Masonic Lodge sitting on 705, and you shouldn't allow wickedness like Freemasons to free reign in this city. And you shouldn't allow blank. And you should... The burden of Robbins. You say, why is it a burden? A burden is something really heavy that you bear. And if you were a member of the city of Robbins, and you heard a preacher get up and say, God is coming to destroy you for your wickedness, that'd be a burden. It'd be a weight on your shoulders. That's what happens to Nineveh here. In Nineveh, they've been doing wickedness. You say, what wickedness? You're about to find out. They're gonna, God's going to preach against them. Listen to the burden that he lays on their shoulders. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. You ever wonder how big God is? You ever shake a little dust off your foot? Tonight when you go to bed, pull your foot up on the side of the bed and scrape the bottom of your foot and see the little dust that comes out. That's like the clouds to God. Those big clouds that are huge over our head, that's just like dust on God's feet. The clouds are the dust of his feet. He's, uh, the Bible says, doth not he fill the heavens? He's huge. God is, he created the universe. He's, he's bigger than that. He, he's not down on our size. He's not down to, to our little level. He's massive, he's powerful, he's angry, he's jealous. And if you're not on God's side, he's scary. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7, the Bible says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Now that, right there, is a good verse to memorize. The Lord is good, and a, uh, excuse me, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. That's a good one to remember when you're going through a hard time. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 1. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition. You say, what's the munition? Do you know any words that sound like that? Munition? And munition. And munition. Keep the munition. Save up your bullets. Save your arrows. Save your spears. Keep the munition. Watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. Why? Because he that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. And right there, I think that's talking about the Antichrist coming against Jerusalem. They're supposed to keep the munition. Look at chapter 3, verse 4. <clears throat> Here's the reason. Say, why is God so bad at Nineveh? Why does he put a burden on them and tell them he's jealous and angry and going to destroy them? Look at Nahum 3, verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot. Then some strong words. The mistress of witchcrafts. I mean, you talk about calling somebody names. 
What does she do? What is this city, Nineveh, the mistress of witchcrafts? What does she do? That selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Sounds a lot like a country I know. Mm -hmm. Verse 5. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame, and I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. Nineveh. Nineveh was a great mighty city. Think of Nineveh as a city like Los Angeles or New York. Everybody in the world knew about it. They knew it was a center of business. You know, they probably made motion pictures there. I don't know. They had lots of merchandise. They had a lot of merchants. And God called it a city of whoredoms. He called it the mistress of witchcrafts. It's a bad place. And God's going to wipe it off the map. In a city, you know, people make songs about Los Angeles. And they write songs about New York. And they worship the city. And they love it. But God says, no, I'm going to uncover your filth and your disgustingness, and I'm going to show people just how ugly you really are. I'm going to show the whole world just how gross you really are, how vile you really are. And something you need to remember as a Christian is that those things in this world, things like Washington, D.C. that seem nice and pretty, things like New York and Los Angeles and the pop stars that you like to listen to, the rappers you listen to, I don't know if anybody in here listens to rappers, but the, the evil musicians you listen to who are world famous, that the world loves, those things are filthy in God's sight. The Bible says, That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination with God. New York City, somebody in the world might look at it and go, What a beautiful eight or ten million people. You know, billions of dollars are made there every day. And, and look at all the homeless who are fed. And look at all the products that come out of it. And God says, Yeah, well, look at the homeless men starving on the street who get kicked every day. And look at my name being blasphemed there every day. Every time somebody steps on a subway, they curse under their breath and hate how they're going to work. And while they're at work, they curse God. And when they're going home from work, they curse God. And it's not a righteous place. It's a wicked place. There's a few righteous people in it, but it's a wicked place. Don't look up to the things that the world looks up to, is what I'm trying to say. The city of Nineveh was a wonderful place in the world that the people of the world would have looked up to. Just remember... If it's powerful and mighty in the world, it's probably not on God's side. Probably not. <clears throat> Last, Habakkuk. We're going to do one more book in this class. Habakkuk. I don't know when it was written. What I do know is the book of Habakkuk has three chapters, 56 verses. Three chapters, 56 verses. And... 1,475 words. <clears throat> the book of Habakkuk. We're going to do one more quick little walk through this book, and then we will be on our way. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says the burden. There's a burden again. Is this one to Nineveh? Let's see. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. <laughs> o Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. So God put this burden on Habakkuk. He showed him a vision that was violent and awful and terrible to behold. And, God, and Habakkuk is asking God, God, why are you showing this to me? This is awful. This is terrible. I'm having to watch people die. Things are being stolen. Spoiling and violence are before me. Let's learn some more about this book. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets, that he may run that readeth it. So God gives Habakkuk a vision. And Habakkuk doesn't have an answer from God. God, what you, what's the purpose of this? And he doesn't have an answer yet. So what does Habakkuk do? He gets up on a tower and he watches. God hasn't answered me yet, so I'm just watching. He's going to show up and answer me eventually. I'm just watching and waiting until he does. 
Here's a lesson for you and me. If God gives you something out of the Bible or God puts a burden on you and you pray and ask God for an answer and he doesn't answer you right away, what should you do? Pray. Give up and quit and walk away, right? Get mad at God? No. What did Habakkuk do? He got up on a tower and he shut his mouth and he said, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the answer. I bet he threw up another couple prayers while he was standing there waiting. Wait. When God doesn't answer your prayer right away, what can you do? Wait. Wait. Say, is he going to answer me? Probably. Just wait. He's going to answer you eventually. Just wait. Say, how many years? I don't know. Just wait. I'll set my watch and set me up on the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. So, hey, Habakkuk, write down what I showed you. Write it down. And make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Tables. In the Old Testament, we're talking about tables of stone. Tables. Maybe wood, I don't know, but tables. He wanted Habakkuk to write out this scripture on the tables. Why? Why would he do that? That he may run that readeth it. <laughs> Here's the idea. Somebody walks up and sees the vision of Habakkuk. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed utterly, and it's going to be terrible, and you're going to hate it, and people are going to be killed. And When they see that, here's what God wants them to do. Get out of Jerusalem. Just like in Matthew chapter 24, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation, you which are in Judea, run to the mountains. Get out of there. Why? Because you don't want to be in Jerusalem right now. Um, <clears throat> look on verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. That's in the future. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That's so good right there. God is telling them destruction is coming, but not just yet. Now don't give up on that prophecy because it is coming. Has Jerusalem been utterly destroyed just like God said in the Old Testament? No. You remember that army we learned about in Joel? They look like... Um, they look like locusts. They have the face of horses or faces of lions. They bite like lions. They have tails like scorpions. That army that there was smoke and fire in front of them and smoke and fire behind them. They could run up a wall like it was nothing. They're fast as lightning. You remember that scary army from Job? That hasn't happened to Jerusalem yet. God said it would happen and it hasn't happened yet. And it's been like 2,500 years since God said so. So what should we do? Give up and say, oh, God's a liar. His word isn't true. No. Here's what you do right here. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. You're going to see that verse pop back up in the book of Romans, where it says the just shall live by faith. And in Romans, it's talking about someone who has faith in God and is justified. Right here, it's talking about someone who sees a table that says Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, has faith in God's words, and runs. And you know what his faith means if he sticks around? Diddly squat. His faith had to have works. He had to run. He had to get out of there. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. We'll move along. <clears throat> 2, 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, have you ever been down to the sea? Have you been to the ocean? Have you been to Myrtle Beach? Anywhere? And when you look out at the sea, is there any part of the sea that doesn't have water? No, the sea is 100% covered in water, right? Mm -hmm. The sea is water, apparently. So, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there's a day coming... When everybody on the earth, every single person, will have the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And if you study that phrase, the glory of the Lord, you'll learn that Jesus Christ is the glory of God. Everybody's going to be able to behold him sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. Everybody's going to know what God looks like, know what he's like, know what his rules are. <clears throat> That's coming after the tribulation. That's coming in the future. Hopefully not too long from now. Look at verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. There's a lesson from the book of Ecclesiastes. I can't remember the exact quote. I think it's Ecclesiastes 5. It says, when you go to the house of God, basically shut up. When you're about to be in God's presence, it's probably a good idea to shut your mouth and listen. Most people, 
when they think about their relationship with God, you know, I've heard people even around here say, well, I have a good relationship with God. I talk to him all day long. Well, that's great. You ever shut up? <laughs> and I, you know, it sounds funny, but I mean that serious. You ever shut your mouth and listen to what God's saying? Because if you're talking all the time, then you're not listening. It's good to pray. You ought to. But if you're doing all the talking and God's doing none of the talking, if you're, no, if you're not listening at all, you don't have a good relationship with God. Ecclesiastes 5.2, the Bible says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. God, I, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a thing or two to say to God. Oh, really? <laughs> really? If the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. It's going to. <laughs> let all the earth keep silence before him. When God reveals himself from heaven at the end of the tribulation, you know what happens? There's silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. What you're hearing right now, but a little quieter. Silence in heaven for 30 straight minutes. You know why? Because when people see God, all that pride goes away. All the foolish things you thought your whole life vanish when you see, that's God. He's real. I'm looking at him. He's coming to kill me. You know, if you're not saved, that's what you're going to see. You're going to shut up. <sighs> 3, chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. Habakkuk 3. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shegeonoth. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Good. When God talks, he should be afraid. He should tremble at his words. I heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Tenan. Now, I'm going to read here verses 3 through 13. And you're going to hear a bunch of names of cities. There's a good sermon you can look up. I think it's by Dr. Uckman called The Path of the Second Advent. It's talking about the route that God is going to take when he comes back at the second coming. He's going to land at a certain spot and he's going to go through certain cities and he's going to wind up busting through the east gate of Jerusalem and enter the city. But there's a, a path, a route that he's going to take. And this right here tells you a lot of that route. Listen to verse 3. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his head, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Have you ever been to the mountains out west? We talked about the, be the beach on the east. Have you ever been three hours to the west to the mountains? See those beautiful, and you know, the Appalachian Mountains are gorgeous. I grew up in them, but they're not huge. If you've ever seen some real mountains like the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas, those, I mean mountains, mountains. Those mountains that you see, they're huge and beautiful. When God comes back, when Jesus Christ lands his feet on the earth, here's what those mountains are going to do. They're going to flatten and be bowing down to God. Those mountains. See, that's impossible. Just wait till you see God. <clears throat> Verse 7. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of thy salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the net. Selah. So God takes vengeance. He lands on the earth. He marches. He has a spear in his hand. The mountains are bowing before him. There's fire at his feet. There's pestilence before him. You say, what's he going to do? He's going to save his people, Israel, from that wicked Antichrist, and he's going to cut the Antichrist's head off. Discovering the foundation, even to the neck. 
How do you know all that? Uh, read Habakkuk. It's right there. That's some fun weekend reading. Look at verse 16. When I heard, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. That sounds like the United States. He will invade them with his troops. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places, to the chief singer upon my stringed instruments. That's the end of the book of Habakkuk right there. You say, how in the world? Habakkuk right there is singing a song. It's a hymn. It's a psalm of Habakkuk. If you saw God doing all that destruction and killing, how could you be happy and joyful? Well, first, if you're on his side, you should be happy and joyful. If you're on his side, you're doing the killing with him, actually, if you're in the armies. Two, God is saving his people, Israel. Here's something fun to think about for the church, and I'm finished with the minor prophets now. As a member of the church, the body of Jesus Christ, if you've been saved, and to be saved means that you've trusted in Jesus Christ, that his blood was shed for your sins, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again, that if you trust in him, he will save you from your sins, and you'll never have to pay for them. If you have done that, if you've believed on Jesus Christ, you are in the body of Christ. And God has a whole Old Testament here for the Jews, for Israel. And if God lets one of those promises he made to Israel slip, then the promises he made to you don't mean anything either. Right. One of those promises. He's made hundreds, maybe thousands, to the Jews. We just read a bunch of them. If one of these things doesn't come true, then maybe it won't come true that you'll go to heaven. Maybe it won't come true that you're saved from hell. You know, every word that he says is important. And he's never let one fall either. And, and we read Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Amen? Amen. 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 That is... Jonah, Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. We have one more lesson, Lord willing. Next week, we'll finish the Old Testament in our overview. Now, we could take years and years in each one of these books, but uh, we're doing an overview, kind of getting a big picture of the Old Testament. And now you know a couple things about these books. Maybe you didn't know. Maybe you didn't know that Jonah and Nahum are both about the city of Nineveh. That's cool. Maybe you didn't know that Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Now you know. Take note and remember it. Okay, any questions at all about those minor prophets? Great, let's take a break. If you answered any questions, or if you got any of the sword drills right, that box is available to you. And if you didn't get any sword drills right, the box is available to you. <laughs>